Welcome to Sky Team's People First with Morag Barrett. Here, we'll be exploring the people side of successful businesses, careers, and lives. We all have a story to share, and there's something to be learned in every story. Join us to learn from authors, business leaders, thought leaders, and people just like you to uncover the latest ideas, resources, and tools to help you become more effective at work and life. As it turns out, the secret to success is cultivating winning relationships. Business is personal and relationships matter. Welcome everybody. My guest this week is my friend and colleague, Leanne Davey. Many claims to fame. One of those is that she has not climbed Mount Everest and probably never will. She's never been to space. So you and I, Leanne, need to talk about that because yeah. that's my fantasy job, Star Trek, the next ent- uh, next generation and being yeah. on the Enterprise. She doesn't even have an Olympic medal, um, though she says she does, did win grade nine physical education. Woo, that definitely requires celebration. And the prize for solving the most difficult team challenge is named after you, or at least <laughs> it should be and will be. <laughs> But more importantly, Leanne, I know that you bring more than 25 years of research and expertise helping teams achieve high performance. You're known as the teamwork doctor, so I'm curious to know how you got that moniker. And you've worked with teams around the world from boardroom to frontline and across industries. Um, You've worked with Fortune 500 companies and small startups that some of us have never heard of. And I know from your book and your research that you've developed a unique perspective on the challenges that teams face. So welcome, Leanne. I know that that introduction is not to be desired in terms of that there's mystery behind all of it. So fill in some of the blanks. What are some of the exciting things that you have done throughout your career and life that bring you to this (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. So I, um, as a little kid, I loved learning about how things were made. So any of the kids shows or documentaries about how they made crayons or how they made Q-tips or I loved factory um, videos and and learning about Mm -hmm. that kind of thing. And at some point, I realized that I did not have any of the talents that would allow me to have a profession or a career in industrial engineering or anything like that. But at some point, I realized that in some ways, the machine of the modern industry is actually a team. When you think about how much of our work is knowledge work now, uh, that I could start to think about a team as a machine that's just as interesting in how the cogs either fit together or don't. Um, and so I studied and did my doctoral work in organizational psychology, um, which is what I refer to as water cooler psychology <laughs> as opposed to <laughs> clinical psychology. And then I have spent my career since 1998 uh, working with executive teams, working with leaders in organizations, trying to find the way to make a team be as well-oiled a a machine as some of those ones we see of, you know, um, soda factories, you know, putting the carbonation and the lids on this. How do we get a team, a, a bunch of humans to be as efficient and effective as that? So that's my joy. I, I love doing that work. And um, the good news is I don't expect to be out of work anytime soon because dysfunction on teams and the challenge of getting humans to work together is not quite as simple as uh, as getting a machine to work effectively. No, and we'll talk about this later. I know with other the leaders that I work with through Sky Team, they try to avoid conflict. So we'll talk about later on how you need to embrace it. But the reason I brought you in is that I got a copy of your latest book, The Good Fight, which is just amazing. I highlighted and made notes, and it just reinforced some of the things I have, but more importantly, just added a wealth of information and perspective. So let's just start with a title, because The Good Fight sign sounds like a contradiction in terms. It does. It does. It's conflict good. Yeah. So I talk about the Good Fight title as what I was really doing was writing two books in one. And I almost wish it could be so that, you know, the first half of the book you read one way and then you flip it over and read the other half the other way. So if you think about the two books in one, the first book is the book about the fight. Mm -hmm. And 
people like uh, many of your clients, people like me, if we're being honest, which we're being honest here, um, okay. hate conflict, avoid yes. conflict. And so the reason that fight was in the title is because I wanted to educate people that some things are worth fighting for. And that's a hard message because I think a lot of us um, avoid it, uh, shy away from conflict, procrastinate an uncomfortable conversation. So the first reason I called it the good fight was that we need to embrace the fight. But the reason it's called the good fight is if you flip that book over and you think mm -hmm. about all the people who they have no problem fighting, but the fights are not constructive, they're harmful. What I refer to as the difference between productive tension, which is really a positive thing, and, and friction, which wears yeah. us down. So the second, the second book within this book is really the book for people who need to learn how to have conflict in a way that uh, does less collateral damage, is yeah. better for productivity, better for relationships. So that was my idea, was that I needed to write uh, sort of two books in one to help people who think that conflict is a dirty word and something that they shouldn't be uh, engaging in, and uh, at the same time be able to help the people who already are pretty comfortable with conflict, but maybe a little too comfortable and needed to learn how to have mm. conflict more effectively. Too feisty, bring it on, sort, but don't worry about the consequences. It was yeah. funny, as you were describing it there, A, if we're being honest, yes, I too um, shy away from tough conversations. I don't like the messy bit at the beginning, yeah. but I love it when you come through the other side. And as yes. you were talking about that, it immediately made me think of the Wizard of Oz. You know, we go through the the twist yeah. of arms and it's all. And that's the maelstrom of the conflict and the angst. And the am I going to destroy this relationship? But I'm trying to help. Yeah. And then you come through and the clouds part, and it's like, ah. yes, if exactly. Do it well. Yeah, so I often talk about how I think about conflict the same way as I think about exercise. So. Um, I, I am about five years in, six years in maybe to having a personal trainer, to taking my health and my fitness seriously. Um, and five years in, I still hate exercise, mm -hmm. but I love having exercised. So I think the same way about conflict. Uh, I've been working on this for a long time. I still don't like conflict. Yeah. I still don't enjoy it when I'm planning for it or thinking about it. I still get sweaty palms. Um, but now I understand like you, that I like having been through the conflict and being on the other side of it. So whether it's doing my ab workout every week to help strengthen my core and not get a sore yeah. back or having that uncomfortable conversation or giving somebody some feedback, um, both of those things are a little uncomfortable for a short while and then allow me to be much more comfortable and have a much, much better life all the rest of the time. So it's interesting because one of the concepts you describe in the book is um, conflict debt. Yeah. So what does that mean? Yeah. So I use a really simple example to explain this. So I live in Toronto and uh, many years ago now we had a brand new fancy toll highway put in and I avoided the toll highway for a long time and I lived downtown so I don't need to take it very often. But one day there was traffic on the other highway and I thought I'm going to take that toll highway and I got on and it was one of those ones that takes the picture of your license plate and then mm -hmm. sends you a bill in the mail. And I got my bill a few weeks later for $7 uh, for taking this toll highway, which was all fine, except because I only took it once, I didn't have the cool transponder, mm -hmm. and it meant I needed to write a check. A check. Okay. That's pretty sure old. I have one of those somewhere. And then I needed to put the check in an envelope and, and put a stamp on it. And then once I had put the check in the envelope with the stamp, I had to remember to take it to the post. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. Well, long story short, uh, when the collections agency finally settled the account, I paid $135. Leanne. Okay. <laughs> so um, that's how I talk about conflict. Okay. What's the conversation that if you had had it right away, would have cost you about seven bucks? It wouldn't have been great. It would have been a little uncomfortable. You might have had to say something the other person didn't really want to hear, but ah, no big deal. But because you procrastinated it, because you told yourself that you were picking your battles or, or whatever great story you told yourself, that um, animosity, resentment, <laughs> that mm -hmm. sort of grudge built up and affected your interactions 
forevermore. Every email you got from that person after that fact, you, you read with a slightly different narrator's tone in your voice. And ultimately, uh, if the issue finally came to a head, it probably cost you and your team the $135 because everything blew up, it, it stalled progress, it, it, it was a big deal. So yeah. that's conflict debt. It's when there are issues that we need to discuss to get to the other side of a conflict, but instead we leave them undiscussed and they build up and we kind of pay that interest in how our feelings and the postponement of that discussion affects all sorts of other things in our organizations and, and in our own stress levels. Um, that's complicated. That. It's not just that it affects us, me right. and you, if it's just between us or within the team. It's that ripple effect of how it affects up and downstream as well. Exactly. And so conflict debt is something our organizations just cannot afford because it affects our productivity. Uh, it affects the trust and the cohesion on our teams. And then, of course, it affects us as individuals. So we now know that um, about 45% of people say, and it's interesting during uh, work from home times, it might be a little bit different, but in normal operations, 45% of people say their sleep is interrupted on sa Sunday nights because mm -hmm. of the stress of going back to work. A lot of that, and the next worst day is Mondays, which is only 17%. So there's this massive effect yeah. of us dreading um, all the things, all that conflict, debt, all the stuff all week that we have not dealt with, that now we're going into a new work week and knowing that that's going to confront us. So it's, it's really, really unhealthy for us at kind of all these different levels for the organization, for yeah. productivity, for our teams, for engagement, and then for us and our own stress and well-being. So when I was growing up, I grew up with the Green Cross Code, which was how to cross the road safely as a child. Okay, good. And you have the Conflict Code. Yes. Any key elements and behaviors that help us to navigate conflict safely. Yeah. So tell us about those. Yeah, so one of the interesting things is we tend to go into conflict wanting to uh, get our truth across or having our position win. And so, and even sometimes when we're not even being selfish, we're just honestly trying to get the best answer, we go straight to the solution. Well, if we did this, it would be fine. And the problem is that that creates this adversarial kind of relationship, um, which tends to either um, cause people to dig in and it gets really unpleasant or commonly, and of course I'm Canadian, so this is really true for us, um, to cause the conflict to go underground. Okay. <laughs> and the people just smile and kind of nod at you and then they, you know, complain about you at the water cooler. Um, so the first step in the conflict code is to actually start by communicating, um, opening up the line of communication, doing things that uh, bring in information from the other person before you say anything about your own position. So communicate is the first step in, in the conflict code. Then you need to create a connection. And the, the simplest way I can explain creating a connection is simply speak the other person's truth before you speak your own. Okay. And if you're able to do that, if in the communication stage, you're able to communicate in a way that, you know, gets them talking, then in that connection stage, you can say, okay, I get, so for you, you're paying attention to this part of the issue, or you think we need more of this. It's a very simple thing we need to do to simply, you know, speak the other person's truth. And then you've earned the right once you've validated the person and really spent some time in their um, perspective on the world. Then you've earned the right to add your perspective and then to contribute to problem solving as allies together. So it's a very simple code. And in the book, I give six different strategies for different situations that I call the conflict strategies for nice people. Um, oh, no. So there, there are different um, words and techniques that I lay out, but they each are based on this idea. First, communicate, get the other person speaking. Second, connect, um, validate them, speak their truth so that they feel you're going to have this conflict as allies. And then, then you can test out solutions. And, and usually we just go straight for our version of the truth. Uh, and that creates a lot of animosity, makes life a lot harder. 
I love the word ally because, as you know, that appears in my book too. I know, I know, I know. If you're an ally, we've been kindred you. spirits for a long time, Laura. Yeah, you know, kindred spirits. But you also have a whole section like me talking about the difference with that between being nice and, more importantly, being kind. Yes. So from your perspective, what's the difference between the two? Yeah, I I think of nice as a passive cop out. Which, okay. you know, again, like I live in a country where we kind of the only thing anyone in the world knows about Canadians other than sort of snow is nice, right? Okay. Um, so it's a, a bit sacrilegious in Canada to, to complain about being nice. But um, so if I have, if I've just watched your presentation or maybe you've, you've trialed a presentation on me to then, because uh, you're going to give it to the boss later, and I want to be nice. Uh, I may not give you uh, candid feedback. I mean, uh, there may be a few things that I just sweep that under the carpet and don't mention. If, on the other hand, I say that my standard for myself is to be kind, kind to me is a higher bar and it tends to be more active. So in that case, would it be kind to leave you heading into the conversation with the boss mm -hmm. um, unprepared or, or not as ready to do uh, your absolute best or those sorts of things? So for me, kind is a higher bar. And I share it because it's useful to me personally, because in my head, I will have conversations with myself about something I want to say to someone. And, and these little voices, like, you know, my grandmother's voice telling me, if you can't say anything nice, don't say anything at all. So that little voice in my grandmother's voice that we think, oh, Leanne, that's not very nice. And that's kind of how I'm thinking about it. And, <laughs> sorry. Yeah. We had the same grandma. I, know. I think it's in the grandma handbook, right? Um, although fortunately my mom is uh not like that. She's she's better on um saying so, what needs to be said. Yeah. But so instead of listening to our grandmother's handbook voice of if you have anything nice to say, don't say anything yeah. at all. What are the how do we respond? How do we be yeah, so that's where kind became my replacement. So if I hear that voice, I just say, Leanne, what would be kind here? Right? Mm -hmm. And kind to me is a little bit longer term. So right in the long run, this person understanding this about themselves, being able to um, change something that would make them more successful, that's more kind. Um, for a person hearing something from me as an ally is much better than them hearing it later from somebody who's more mm -hmm. adversarial. Yeah. Um, so this kind language in my own head, that's why I, you know, all authors are the same, right? We, we share the things that we find helpful. So it's helpful to me to use this bar of what is kind. Um, and that's my antidote to the, if you can't say anything nice line. So now I think about it as if you have to say something not nice, be kind um, mm -hmm. instead of not saying things that aren't nice. Because you know what? The, the, the world is hard. Uh, navigating um, relationships is hard. You know, the kinds of things we're trying to do in business, they're hard. Uh, and so there are times we're going to have to hear things that we don't want to hear or that aren't necessarily nice. But if we can hear those in a way that has is full of kindness um, and full of somebody being our ally telling us those things, uh, it's just a much, much, much better thing so it seems to be, you used the word ally again earlier on and it's that whole quality of the relationship that really has an impact on the conversation and the outcome so how does one build that foundation of trust the right relationship in order to be able to have a good fight yeah i talk about trust in sort of four levels um, my husband, who's my partner, calls it uh, the trust cake. <laughs> so, so the base of the trust cake is really about trust in the human brain is about predictability. So our brains are built to be able to spot things in the environment that are not what we expected because that's how we get a sense of whether we're unsafe. And so at the most fundamental level, if people are predictable to us, we trust them more. Uh, so if you think about your teammates, do I know what's going to get you excited? Do I know what's going to make you upset? Do I know when you're going to blow your stack? Do I, mm -hmm. right? And if I know those things, you're more trustworthy to me because uh, you are predictable to me. So connection 
what you should do if you want to proactively invest in trust with somebody is to strengthen that connection. We know from studies that the easiest, fastest, best way to do that is to physically break bread with someone. So uh, whether it comes from evolutionary things that if you, you, you know, if animals went to the watering hole together, that meant they must trust one another. Um, but we know now that neurochemicals are released when you physically eat beside someone. So the fastest mm -hmm. thing you can do is have one of those pizza lunches and physically eat around people who are new to your team. So the more that you can do that, the better. So it's the connection level. The next level is about capability and credibility. Mm -hmm. Interestingly, what we tend to do when we want someone to trust us is we tell them all of the degrees we have and all the mm -hmm. fancy institutions from which we gleaned those degrees, right? We, we like tell our story. The best way to have somebody um, believe that you're more credible is actually to keep them talking. <laughs> so okay. asking somebody, how would you approach this? How do you think about it? Where did you go to school? What? Yeah. And if you get them talking, because humans are crazy creatures, they tend to trust us more. So that level of credibility comes from asking them great questions, getting them talking about how they'd approach a task so we can get that second level. The third level, which is the level that's most often broken these days, is trust is really about reliability. So do you do what you said you were going to do? Do you deliver? And one of the reasons that's so broken right now is we're way overcommitted. And so we say yes to things that we can't deliver on, which really makes people not trust us. So the next thing you can do in proactively building trust is you know be really careful about what you say yes to in some it seems so paradoxical but sometimes we build trust with people by saying i can't take that on i can't do that and do that well um so that's an important thing but when you are you know doing something for somebody else setting a lot of milestones making sure that you have shared expectations so mm -hmm. that they you as reliable. And then at the top of the trust cake is integrity. And that's about, you know, being vulnerable with people. If you're going to, you know, blow something, making sure they know ahead of time that you, you have um, not left them vulnerable. So there's things, so the book goes through these steps you can take to build trust proactively, even before uh, you need that trust. So I, I share the quote in the book of don't wait till you're thirsty to dig the well. And that's mm -hmm. what we so often do. We have colleagues in other departments that we've never built a relationship with until we urgently need yeah. something from them. We send them an email. Uh, did you like that? We send them an email. That's yeah. not an email. That's a phone it's call. But we don't do that, that anymore. We don't do that. So we send them an email. We're like, I need this right away, urgent. And they're like, who, who are you? <laughs> mm -hmm. So we have to establish trust because we know that conflict is so much about what are the biases we have. Um, I talk about it as the mother-in-law effect. So we know that your mother could do something and your mother-in-law could do the exact same thing and you would interpret it completely differently. Mm -hmm. The same is true in an organization. So how do you build trust in advance so they don't even interpret things as conflict because they, you know, they think you're, an, as we were talking about, as an ally, right? Yeah. Yeah. There's so much you can do to build trust proactively. So we're here talking three months into COVID work from yeah. home. I was going to say three inches in to yeah, COVID. Inches. You know, I've done the same, the wisdom hairs and all of this coming through. Ooh, I like wisdom oh, hairs. Yeah. There are going to be some great COVID hairstyles to be shared in due course. Yeah. But what I'm also hearing from my clients is that those teams that were perceived and felt solid when we were working in the same building together yes. are now starting to feel stressed and strained when we're working independently and making do with whatever equipment we have. Yeah. So what are you seeing and hearing and what advice do you have for teams that need to now conflict when I can't actually be there with you? Yeah. So it was interesting. The first six weeks or eight weeks, uh, we saw a tremendous decrease in team dysfunction mm -hmm. because we're good in a crisis, mm -hmm. right? Everybody knew it was a crisis. Everybody knew they had to be their best selves. Mm -hmm. um, everybody kind of sucked it up. So mm -hmm. for the first while, we were seeing much less dysfunction. But what's happened now is now we're into this prolonged 
odd, ambiguous, I don't know what's going to happen. And now we're actually seeing things get much worse. So one of the main reasons is because of conflict debt. So many people are telling me candidly that, well, I didn't want to broach that over a Zoom call or, mm -hmm. you know, that's something we really should talk about face to face. And like, so that grudge that you're holding, you're just going to hold it till like 2022. <laughs> Yeah. And so because of what I was talking about earlier, that once you have, um, say you were in a Zoom call, and, I, and this is a true story. So uh, one of my clients said we had a Zoom call and we could see a couple of people kind of looking down at their phones and we, we think they were texting each other during a team meeting, like uh -huh. complaining. Yeah. So yeah. I said, Frankly, you have no idea whether it was someone's kid texting to say, I can't find the ketchup in the fridge, yeah. which is really possible. I've had a few of those. I'm like, I'm not doing a podcast. You were um, eyes. <laughs> exactly. So I said to that person, like, okay, so you're now going to carry that around as that niggling grudge in the back of your head. And now the next email that you get from one of those two people the narrator that reads that email to you in your head is going to be like, I hit it, I hit it, I hit it, I hit it, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I think one of the reasons we're in such trouble right now is people aren't sure what conflict rules apply during work from home. And they're tending to let more and more pile up in their conflict debt, thinking that they need to wait. And that's now clouding and making so many other interactions more toxic. So what we need to do is start digging out of that conflict debt. And maybe we can't sort of pay the whole thing off, but at least we can make regular monthly payments. <laughs> at least we can um, have little points to, to say, how's this working? Where are you having challenges? What do we need to tell each other? We can at least do a little bit of it uh, while we're going. So there's not quite so much baggage yeah. that's piling up. So on that point, I mean, my, my coaching advice, the teams and leaders I'm working with is to do just that. You need to recalibrate and make explicit the new rules of engagement. And I've seen everything from, well, you've got to have a professional office studio set up. And I'm thinking, well, I've got colleagues like who, well, yeah, who are working in tiny apartments. They don't have right. space. You're going to see the bed, just make it, you know, that sort of thing. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We don't make the implicit explicit. Then it starts to build up. So what advice do you have for leaders or team members? Because we need to own this as a yeah. team member as well. It can't be just on the boss. Yeah. What are the first steps that we can take to just start having that conversation about how we're going to fight yeah. while being apart? Simply. Just make it simple. Just, you know, well, for example, if you listen to this podcast or watch the podcast, you have this great opportunity to say, you know, I was watching a podcast mm -hmm. and they were talking about how many teams are getting into some difficulty because they're tending to avoid topics are we doing that or what kinds of topics are we avoiding or like something that simple to just broach it and, and get a sense. And the, the good news about that kind of a question is any, any response is um, diagnostic in a sense, right? mm -hmm. because if everybody goes quiet, that's like, Oh, that's interesting that it's quite, it, you know, are these harder things to talk about now? Or, you know, like you've got something good there. Um, or if people uh, are brave enough to say, you know, there have been a couple things where I don't know whether I should say something or not, then you've got something to talk about. So I, I think keep it simple. Um, you know, find ways to broach it in one-on-one -on -one conversations where there may be a little bit more candor to start with. And then, you know, in a team meeting, you can say, I've been asking each of you about how this is going. Um, mm -hmm. And you know, there were a few themes, and so I thought maybe we could spend some time to, today setting our new ground rules. Like, what are our work from home ground rules? Um, ground rules is something that people they kind of understand. We know what that means, but it's quite legitimate to say we kind of need some new ground rules. Um, you know, the expectations we have around email is a is a great one, right? If I'm expecting that somebody's going to respond to an email within 30 minutes or, or that they're looking at them all the time when they're trying to homeschool their kid or they're trying mm -hmm. to cope with something else. So I would use 
you know, after you've broached the topic a little bit, I would say, hey, do we need to set some new kind of ground rules or team norms around this? You know, how responsive do we expect people to be? What's our kind of flex in terms of people who, who need something different? You know, those sorts of things. Um, ground rules is probably a good frame for having that mm -hmm. conversation. Well, thank you, Leanne. That's fabulous advice. And as I say, I, I will be continuing to refer to the book, The Good Fight. I encourage everybody to get their copy. And now more than ever, I think teams and leaders can benefit from working with you and understanding the new way of interacting. Um, so how can people get hold of you, Leanne? Yeah, the easiest way. So I always say easy in one sense, because my, my website is just leannedavy.com, which sounds super easy until you figure out how Leanne Davy is spelled. So it's, L, it's Leanne like Diane, L-I-A-N-E. D A V E Y dot com. And um, that site on the blog, there are 500 searchable articles and tools and resources. My YouTube channel, once you know Leanne Davy, because um, it's not a common name, you can kind of find me on all the social media, my YouTube channel. Um, maybe I'll encourage people on my YouTube channel, there's a video about having conflict effectively using the validation technique. That's just a quickie one that, that people could use. So Leanne Davy kind of gets you everywhere, but leannedavy.com is probably the, the best starting I'm point. I'm sure everything's written down in the comments below. Yeah. <laughs> people are listening while jogging, right? And they're like, how do I write that down? Yes, exactly. Yeah, we'll be there for you for sure. But Leanne, thank you for your time today. I look forward to cocktails when we're all allowed out yes. to play again. Yes. Um, in the meantime, yeah. stay well. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Warwick. So great talking with you. Thank you so much for joining Morag today. If you enjoyed the show, please like and subscribe so you don't miss a thing. If you learned something worth sharing, share it. Cultivate your relationships today when you don't need anything before you need something. Be sure to follow Sky Team and Morag on LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And if you have any ideas about topics we should tackle, interviews we should do, or if you yourself would like to be on the show, drop us a line at info at skyteam.com. That's S-K-Y-E team.com. Thanks again for joining us today. And remember, business is personal and relationships matter. We are your allies.